So I was figuring out this case is from 33 years ago. I was graduating high school, and I'm like doing the math because I'm going, 33 years ago, it can't be because I'm only 35. <laughs> it doesn't work, it can't be that old. On March 3rd, 1981, an operator received a frantic phone call pleading for the police. Operator, I, I, I need the police, I need the police. But before the operator could connect the caller with the police, the phone line suddenly went dead. Investigators believe that call came from Nancy Jo Canode. Her daughter came home from school thinking a everyday normal day just to find her mom murdered. I got to the top of the stairs and I just saw her feet. I couldn't look at her until I just ran back downstairs. When the police arrived, they found Nancy Canode stabbed and strangled in her own condo. Nancy's daughters have been fighting the fight for a long time, too. They got them to reopen the case. They put it all over the paper. You got to give them credit for never giving up. Nancy Canode was such a sweet, beautiful lady. She was involved in her church, involved in several different charities, and was a loving mother to her two young daughters and her son. It's really sad to think that potentially the very last thing anyone heard from her was her cry for help. It has been 16 years and still no answer. Police consider her killing a cold Years case. later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Hey, Hello. good Hi. morning. Hi. Sean Tice. Hey, Hi, Yolanda. Sean Tice. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Bobby Dean. Nice to meet you, nice Bobby. To meet nice to meet you. We're glad y'all are here for the, uh, oh, yeah. the no case. Yes. It's We're actually excited. right there on the board behind you. That's, uh, yes, this is our unsolved uh, homicide case board. As you can see, when we solve one, we stamp it solved. So we're hoping by the end of the week, y'all can help us put it solved on Nancy. Oh, that'd be Nancy. nice, wouldn't it? Nancy was just a super likable person. Would go out of her way to help other folks. Dedicated to her husband and her family and her church. Unfortunately, one of the saddest victims you get in homicide. Let's go start working. Show us where we are. All right, and start tell, just, telling right. us everything. Mr. Spangola. How are you ladies Hey, doing? Steve. This week, we're bringing back Steve Spangola. He's a very skilled interviewer, and in a case like this that's 33 years old with so many witnesses, we're really hoping he can get us to where we need to be. Sean, so tell us the beginning of the case. March 3rd, 1981, about 7 o'clock in the morning, the Bell South operator, Loretta Brown, received a call from the Canode residence. There was a woman asking for law enforcement. At some point during that call, she hangs up. The sheriff's office at the time doesn't go to the residence. About 3 o'clock, her 15-year-old daughter, Suzanne, got home from school. I came home, and I put down my books. And I called mom twice, and she didn't answer. Suzanne describes that she gets to the top of the stairs. She looks at mom's room, and she sees mom's feet. I got to the top of the stairs, and I knew I probably couldn't do much. And she doesn't enter. She's afraid because she feels mom was mutilated. She's scared, runs downstairs, alerts a neighbor neighbor calls the sheriff's office. We get there and ultimately find Nancy, the victim of a brutal homicide. She stabbed with a nice pick, and she stabbed with a knife, and she strangled. Nancy fought very hard with her attacker, tried to save her life, but unfortunately, she didn't. Uh, we all want to start putting our suspects up on the board. Why don't we start with, um, what do y'all want to say, unknown intruder? A random intruder. We have to consider the possibility that Nancy was killed by an intruder who just picked their house at random and didn't expect anybody to be home that day. Okay, so random intruder. The jewelry box. Overturned jewelry box. It's on the floor and it's just open and all the jewelry's out of it. Like it was just dumped out. Unlocked back door, so it's easy access. Location in the complex, being that it's the back unit all the way towards the back. There was a dirt road at the time that ran along the uh, north side of the complex from front to back. OK, that's a good point. More secluded unit. You got the kids with the car in the back. The blue car. The blue car. On the morning Nancy was killed, two students saw a suspicious blue car. It was found behind the condo complex on a dirt road that bypassed the guard gate. We got a new blue car in our world. 
It's possible this car belonged to Nancy's killer. All right, so this is the old picture, Ken Canode. We know that Nancy's husband, Ken, left that morning on a business trip in a white car and that he was hours away when she was discovered that morning. But investigators believe that Nancy was murdered within minutes of Ken leaving the house. So it's possible that Ken just doubled back to kill her and then continued on his trip so that he would have an alibi. Okay, so let's start with the big picture. They'd only been married two years, right? Correct. And it started to look a little muddier when and how. We got some information that Ken was involved with another woman, was having an affair. And what's that lady's name? Carol Farley. Farley. He had a $100,000 policy on Nancy. It paid double, it was like a double indemnity, I guess is what they call it, in the event that she was murdered. So he stood to gain 200 grand. And he wrote that policy? Correct, which wasn't uncommon for someone that sold life insurance to, to buy a policy on their spouse. We know that Ken Canode collected $147,000 on that life insurance policy. So this week, we're going to need to look into Ken's past to see if that insurance money was motive enough for him to kill his wife. Or if way back in 1981, Nancy Jo Canode was killed by an intruder who got away with murder. We're going to go see the two daughters right now, Suzanne and Sherry. It's a 33-year-old case. How long have you been talking to them? Since 09, so almost at uh, five, five years. years. How are y'all? Suzanne and Cherie are two of her children from a previous marriage. They have pushed this case. They have tried to get it moving prosecution-wise for a long, long time, and I'm glad to shake their hand. Tell us some, some memories and stories about your mom. Yeah, she was my best friend. I mean, I'll be honest with you. We had talks, private talks, when nobody was around. She taught me how to cook. I remember Mom, uh, she used to brush her hair 100 times a day. Yeah. And then she would tell me to do that. <laughs> And yeah, I think every child thinks their mom is the most beautiful. Uh, but yeah, she literally really was like the, the prettiest homeroom mother. Anyone in the neighborhood just knew she was very beautiful. I just remember calling her name and her not answering and walking up the stairs. And I saw her feet and I turned and ran and went back down the stairs to call police. And you, did, you knew not to go all the way in the room. You didn't go all the way in the room. Something stopped me. I don't think I knew, but something you know, perhaps in grace or something stopped me from going all, all the way into the room because I heard that it was a, a terrible, terrible scene. I remember just running out and shouting and crying and going to the Thompson's house, frantically knocking on their door. So I started calling that morning and then when this man answers and he said, this is Officer Sunset. -and, and he goes, you need to come down here right away. And I said, oh my goodness, and I, I don't even remember. I can't remember the drive down there. My father was there. I grabbed him. I said, please tell me where my mother is. And he said, she's gone. And I was like, do what? And he said, yes. I'm sorry, Sheree. She said, something bad's really happened. And uh, I was freaked out. And I just grabbed my sister and I held her. When was the first time you saw Ken after this happened? I don't think he even cared to walk over and say a word to us until the funeral. Maybe not and until even the funeral. Then, Nothing? It was just, no, not from my memory. He never seemed emotional. Nothing. Anyone, our cousins, they all say how odd it was that he was not very upset. How did you watch how losing your mom affected your grandmother? Oh, it, I'll be honest with you, it tore her up. But even worse, it tore up my grandfather. I think that's actually what killed him. It sent him yeah. over the edge, too. He couldn't handle it because his little girl was gone. This tour, our family up, has never been forgotten in my mind. And I'm so happy that it's not forgotten. Thank you. In 1981, there was no 911 emergency service. On the morning she was killed, the police believe that Nancy called the operator for help. Get you to sit right here. This How is Kelly, here? Miss Loretta. Nice to meet you. Loretta was the operator who took that call, so we need to see if there's anything else she heard to help us maybe identify Nancy's killer. You know, you don't forget things like that. You could hear her breathing. You know, she, you could hear the fear in her, and, and she's breathing heavy, and she, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Operator, I, I, I need the police, I need the police, you know. 
Hear anybody in the background? I don't know whether I heard it or whether I felt that there was another person there. She didn't say a name or anything like that. The minute I hear the way she was reacting, I hit the button. Okay, and hitting the button means what? Show us. So the manager else. comes in and plugs in, or a supervisor plugs in. But the, she wasn't on the phone that long. Since they did not have the technology back then to trace the call to an exact address, police were never sent out there that day. In the wake of Nancy's death, Ken actually sued the county for not responding that day. By the time the supervisor came on, she was gone. Wow, it's very pretty out here. It is. You would definitely think upscaled. It doesn't sound like they had a lot of violent crime up here. Uh-uh. I'm sure this crime in this type of a, a community just provoked fear. We're on our way to the former home of Nancy Jo Canode, who was stabbed to death in her bedroom on March 3rd, 1981. We believe she was killed by either her husband, Ken, or an intruder who was surprised to find her at home. There's the unit. The St. John's County Sheriff's Office tested several pieces of evidence and unfortunately, no DNA was useful in this case. So there's still a lot of questions to what exactly happened in this condo 33 years ago. This is currently for sale. That's why it's empty. Layout hasn't changed. But this is our real back door, the one we're talking about, our yes. real sliding door. Yes, and obviously there would have been a stick and play, something like that, it's just a uh, wooden dowel. Mm -hmm. Investigators believe that Nancy's killer entered the residence through the back sliding glass door because a wooden dowel that was used to block the door was found nearby out of the door track. It's possible the family forgot to put the dowel in place the night before, which is how an intruder would have gotten in the next morning. But this would have been a screen enclosure. Or maybe Ken removed the dowel himself before he left. Let's talk about how he leaves the house that morning and walk through what you think Ken does. I think Ken and Suzanne, the 15-year-old daughter, they leave together at 6.39. Did y'all go out the door together? I believe so, yeah. I went out first and then he went out and locked it. According to Suzanne, who was still nearby waiting for a friend, Ken didn't actually drive away until six minutes later. Investigators are still not sure why Ken took so long to drive off. What he told me in 2010 is that he delayed to make sure that Suzanne went to school. Whether it was Ken or an intruder who took advantage of the unlocked back door, we know the next thing that Nancy's killer did was get the murder weapon. You'd have to go to the kitchen, get the knife. Investigators are certain that the knife that killed Nancy came from her own kitchen. Maybe he's already got his rope and his ice pick. Heads to the upstairs. Nancy possibly hearing the sliding glass door. Knows it's not a traditional method for either Suzanne or Ken to come in the home thinking that it's an intruder, starts to make that call to the operator trying to get law enforcement. What happened next has haunted the investigators for more than 30 years. We believe that Nancy called the operator and urged them to send police, but then the call disconnected on the caller's end. The odd thing is, is that the phone was found neatly placed back in its cradle, not dropped on the floor like one would expect it being attacked. One possibility is that he comes in here She's on the phone, realizes it's Ken, just hangs up the phone. Or it could be that she heard something. She does go to the top of the steps and looks and sees that it's somebody that she doesn't know and locks that door. If it was an intruder, it's possible that Nancy saw them, locked the door and called the operator. If it's locked, he's using the ice pick to defeat that lock. He comes in here. Then the killer hung up the phone themselves after breaking into the bedroom. And if you just open the door with this ice pick, the left side of her body all in through here is where some of those puncture wounds come from that with look the like ice the ice pick. Yes. So I'm hitting you this way. She gets stabbed with that a couple times. The struggle is on. He drops it to help gain control of her, and that's when the knife really comes into play. I probably just she shove falls. you. You fall to the bed. And most of the injuries with the knife come where on her? They're all on that back. Right here. All in this area here. So like 14, 12 14 times? 14 times right here. All right lung is hit six times so it's filling up with blood she's starting to choke on that blood and he's got her and he's got that rope i would be pulling up like this to control you he stabs to a point where i guess she, he feels she expires and he just drops the knife gives a quick wipe like this and off he goes to get ready to get out of here 
So he leaves the weapons here. Yeah, he drops the knife right on her back. And the ice pick. And the ice pick Picks is right, here. right over here where, where the jewelry box is. And a bottom drawer of it is open and there's like jewelry scattered. The scattered jewelry does look like the results of a botched robbery. But since none of the jewelry was missing and nothing else in the house was stolen, it's possible the box was set up after the fact to give the appearance of a robbery that's gone wrong. After the murder, he just needs to get out of here, right? Yeah, right. So we're not going to go out the front door nope. where we would be noticed. So he just comes right back out the right slider. Right through here. This is a great cover, too. The only thing that he would have to just hope is that... No one's out back. If Ken killed Nancy, it's possible he left his car nearby for a quick escape. If it was an intruder who did this, it could explain the mysterious blue car that was parked behind the complex that witnesses saw that day. Hey, Miss Caddenhead, it's Detective Tice. Hey, I appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day to talk to me about the uh, Nancy Canode case. Doris Caddenhead lived two doors down from the Canodes, and she's the person that Suzanne ran to that day when she found her mom. I remember quite well. About 3 o'clock, I heard this horrible screaming and crying, and it was her daughter, and she fell into my arms and said, my mother's been murdered. You lived there for a period of time. Was there a lot of suspicious people or anything back there? No, it was pretty quiet. We are in a gated community, but I don't know if I told the detective or not about a man about three weeks before the murder came into the courtyard there, the cul-de-sac, to my door and wanted to sell me some pictures. And I said, who brought you into this? unit you know there's a gate at the door and it's a guard two or three days later i said nancy did that man come to your unit she said yeah he did now i didn't know if he was a setup man to see who would live in that unit and get a good picture of her you know in my opinion it was a strange thing that it happened soon before the murder On the morning of March 3rd, 1981, Nancy Jo Canode was brutally murdered in her own home. 33 years later, we believe she was killed by either an intruder or her husband, Ken Canode. Ken has been married to or lived with at least eight different women that we know of, so it's important that we try to talk to as many of them as we can, starting with the mistress that he had at the time of Nancy's murder. How'd you hear about Nancy being killed? The next day, he called me. What did he say when he called you? He was very upset. Mm -hmm. And he said someone had killed his wife. And he was going to come by here. Did he come by? Yeah. We believe that Carol and Ken left for a vacation resort just hours after Nancy's funeral. We found some paperwork of a resort called the Breckenridge Resort. Does that ring a bell with you? Breckenridge does, for some reason, okay. why? Well, Ken checks into a, the Breckenridge Resort, uh -huh. and he signs his name, Kenneth Farley. Farley? Yes. And the people down there seem to think that he was with a female, and we believe that that was possibly you. That's yeah. the receipt that Ken signs. Look at this for me. See, he signs Ken J. Farley, number in his party, too. I don't know. Is I don't it? remember going anywhere with him during that period of time. Okay. Do you ever remember anything about a necklace with a... A diamond on it? Yeah. Yeah? You do? Yeah. Where'd you get that? From him. He gave that to you? Yeah, why? Because it was Nancy's. It was Nancy's. Oh, God. I didn't know that. Did Ken ever tell you that he killed his wife? No. Okay. Did Ken ever tell you he had someone kill his wife? No. Okay. It's really disappointing to think that someone who was so close to Ken at the very time of the murder can't give us something more helpful. So now we're going to move on to Ken's wives and girlfriends that he had after Nancy was killed. He's very smart. 
He's very sexy. He's very cunning. Yeah. Most men wish that they had that kind of charm. <laughs> I'm right. telling you. I mean, <laughs> he's everything that a woman looks at. But there's still that something there that you don't quite trust. When I heard that his wife had been murdered, I asked him about it. And he told me that she owed a lot of gambling debts. And they were watching the house. Who is they were watching the house? He never said that. Gambling people? Yeah, well, that's basically what he made me believe. OK. So they had been watching the house. And when they saw him leave, they came in. They came in Just and murdered her. That's really odd, because none of Nancy's friends or family have ever mentioned her having a gambling problem. But we're going to have to consider it as we move through this investigation. Hello? Hey, Pat. This is Sean Tyson, Florida. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Patricia dated Ken in 1985, four years after Nancy's death. How did you meet Ken? My husband had died, and I was really not going through a real good time. And I went over to a bar uh, in San Antonio, and there he was. How long after y'all met at the bar do you think he moved in with you? Two weeks, probably. Two weeks after. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. I, at that time, I had a lot of money. And um, after he moved in with me, he started going out to the local banks. He implied that, you know, we were an item. And so suddenly he got a loan from the bank. Mm -hmm. And then he got a car. And then he bought me a lot of jewelry that, you know, but I, was pay I didn't know I was paying for all of it. I lost my house. I lost my company. Lost any car I had. That was the end. I mean, it was the end of all of it. How long did it take you, Kim, to take all your money and make you lose everything like that? It wasn't a year. Was he working at the time? Well, he didn't work except he worked me. He was drunk most of the time. And he would leave. He would leave my house, you know, like, and just stay out all night and go somewhere. Go somewhere else, probably some other girl or something. He'd just leave me at home. And that's when I went out to this beer joint kind of country place. Somebody told me his car was parked there all the time. That's why I went over there. He saw me at the end of the bar, and he, he just ducked out real quick. So I went out to my car, and he had written on a note under my windshield. And he said, if you know what's good for you, you won't follow me. Patricia paints a pretty disturbing picture of life with Ken, which raises even more questions about what it must be like to be married to him. You met him in Jacksonville? Yes, a girlfriend of mine introduced me to him, and she obviously didn't know what he was. Right. He worked for a property association. He was their manager, and he stole a bunch of money from them. Uh, we had several charge cards, and he had access to all of it. I remember I had a lot of money stolen out of my American Express, and I didn't know he had a gambling problem, but I found out. Pam said that there was a gambling problem, but it was Ken's problem, not Nancy's. And when you think of all the financial problems, it makes a lot more sense that the gambling problems would be his. I remember him calling me, and he said he needed more money, and he gave me some flimsy excuse, but the bottom line, he was, he was gambling in the way. Between all of Ken's gambling problems and the way he liked fancy things, you have to wonder whether or not that $100,000 life insurance policy was motive enough for him to kill his wife. You'd be willing to come in and court and testify? Yeah, betcha. Good for you. Good for you. We believe that Nancy Canogue was either killed by her husband, Ken, or a random intruder who happened upon their house not expecting anyone to be at home. Hey, Rob, it's Sean Tice. Hey, how you doing? Rob Zadonovich lived in the same complex where Nancy and Ken lived. I kind of want to draw your attention to this little blue car that you and Andy saw. On the same morning Nancy was murdered, Rob and a friend saw a blue car parked behind the complex. Investigators believe that that car might be connected to Nancy's murder. It's kind of like a, just a little path walking down, but it's big enough for a car maybe, mm -hmm. but secluded. It's definitely not a spot you would normally want to see a car. Thinking about the vehicle, and thinking about your condo, and thinking about where you think the path might have been, how close do you think that vehicle would have been to the main drag? 
not far off of A1A. Rob's memory of the car puts it way further away from the crime scene than we used to think. Here's 53. This is the Canode resident right here. It's this end unit back here. So this blue car, if, we, if it's in play, is up here. The blue car is what Andy and Robbie spot. I think it's too far for our suspect, if we're to go with the random intruder, that he would park that far from the residence. Reports of the blue car parked on the dirt path have always been a big part of this burglary gone wrong theory. But seeing how far it was parked from Ken and Nancy's, it raises the question as to why an intruder would walk across the entire complex to just randomly choose the condo Nancy was in. Okay, so let's look at our points on the random intruder. So overturn jewelry box, everybody. I think that's part of staging it to try to make Stage. it look like we're all stagers, part okay. of that struggle. Unlock door, easy access. No way an intruder would ever know that door is unlocked. All right. Okay, now that we've eliminated the blue car theory, how do y'all feel about what we do with random intruders still up on our board? Bobby? I think you take it off. It's not even an issue now. Sean? Yeah, I, I agree. Yo? Yeah, it's not an issue. Steve? Take it off. Now it's time for us to focus all of our attention on Ken Canode, but we're going to need a lot more evidence to see if he's behind his wife's murder. Letha is very important, and I think it's important for you to say to her, this is different. We really think we're going to get somewhere. We're very close. Letha Shoemaker was Ken's wife just before Nancy. They had one son together, and they also lived with Letha's son, Michael, who was from a previous marriage. There was something going on with him. Ken was involved with some bad people again, and he needed money desperately because when my son Michael went in and had his appendix operated on, Ken took the insurance money that was supposed to pay for Michael's surgery, and he stole it. Ken and Letha got divorced in 1979, but he obviously still had feelings for her when he was still married to Nancy. I remember it was raining and storming, and I heard the tap on the trailer window. And when I looked out, he was standing out there, and it was late. And I'm thinking, now, what's, why is he here? So I got up and I let him in, and we sat down on the couch, and he was just like, uh, like a, a caged animal. You know, I mean, he was antsy, he was pacey, um, agitated. And I'm thinking, what, you know, what are you doing out here in the middle of the night? So he started rambling on about, you know, I made a mistake, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have left you. My marriage was a mistake. I'm getting out of this. I said, well, what do you mean you're going to get out of it? He said, don't worry about it. He said, I'll take care of it because he said, I, I'm, I will get out of it. And when I saw her on TV, it didn't surprise me. She was dead. Did he ever talk about being sad or was he that? was not sad when she died. He was glad to be rid of her. I'm really upset about the whole thing. I should have, I should have done something for her. I think that I could have helped her. I, 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 I think maybe she wouldn't have died. Deb Burroughs is Letha's cousin. How you doing? So it's possible that she or her husband Tweet might know something about Ken from back when Ken and Letha were together. Did you know Ken, Keno? Yes, I met him a few times before uh, me and Tweet got married. All I remember is Tweet saying that Ken called him and offered him some money. He had a job for him to do. He asked him what it was or what it was about. And he mentioned something about taking, killing somebody or something. We thought he was kidding. Right. Is there any way we can talk to your husband? Uh, he's tough. If Tweet Burroughs was approached by Ken to kill Nancy, he could be our most important witness. But, um, I can work on him. How you doing, Tweet? Tweet might have information that we need. And he's right here, but he doesn't want to talk. We need it. We really do. All we want to do is curse him. OK. You think you can talk him into it? I will certainly try. Deb Burroughs told us that her husband, Tweet, might have some important information about Nancy Joe Canode's murder in 1981. Ken called him, mentioned something about killing somebody or something. I think this might be her again. Sorry to Dean. But so far, he's been unwilling to talk to us. I'll be there in a minute. Uh, 
Is that Tweet? That's yeah. Tweet. Huh. Now Tweet is asking us to come back to his house. So I'm hoping that Deb was able to convince him to tell us what he knows. Thank you, first of all, for talking to us. I'm more than that. Like I said, yesterday we just called That's okay. Card. That's it, it, We all have them, trust me. Well, do you remember a phone call I referenced Kenneth Canote offering you some money to do something? Yeah. I want to say with 10000 Did he say what that $10,000 was for? To take somebody out. Did he say who it was in reference to as far as who he wanted to take out or who he wanted to murder? He said wife. He specifically said wife. The best that I can remember, yes. What were you thinking? And it just don't, it just don't click that, right. it, that it was real. It'd be like, man, this is a joke. Right. Man, what's going on? Right. Is that how you kind of you took it? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have a clue. We were supposed to meet at the famous Amos early in the morning. I went there just to find out was he legit? You know, what's going on here? Gotcha. Yeah. OK. So I pulled in the parking lot, walked up to the front door, looked through the window. Is he facing the door? No, sir. He was facing this way All right. right here. So you got, what, a side view of him? Yes, sir. OK. No doubt it's Ken. Right. One no doubt in my mind. OK. I look in the window and seen people that I thought, uh-oh, I knew if I walked in there, I was dead. So there was another group of people in there? Yeah. No connection with Ken. It's just some people you recognize that you had yeah. problems with before. Yeah. Gotcha. So you leave the famous Amos. Do you ever hear from Ken again? Not to my knowledge. To okay. my knowledge, I never heard from him or saw him. This is a huge piece of evidence against Ken. Even though he never paid Tweet to do the job, the fact that he was at the restaurant waiting shows that he was serious. If this goes to court, you'd be willing to testify against Ken? I wouldn't have no choice, would I? Are you afraid of Ken? I'm just asking, are you afraid of Ken at all? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, in something like this, yeah, it bothers me a little bit that I could be retaliated on. Ken may have been unable to get Tweet to kill Nancy, but it's possible he found someone else to do the job, which may explain some of the evidence at the scene that looks like maybe an intruder killed Nancy. But if Ken paid someone to kill Nancy, he can still be charged with murder. Sally Kaysen. OK, it's been on the right hand side. Although the case against Ken is still mounting, we need to keep talking to people that knew Ken after the murder to see what else we can find out. Hey, Miss Kaysen. I'm Detective Tice with the Sheriff's Office. Hey, I wanted to talk to you about Ken Canode. Sally Kaysen is another of Ken's ex-wives who remembers him talking about the murder. He told me that his wife had been murdered. He told me he was out of town when it happened. Did he ever show any emotion? None. So it's not like it was upsetting to him when y'all talked about it? Flatliner. He tried to file a lawsuit because she tried to call 911 and they didn't show up or the operator there you didn't go. go through. Right. Something like that. He told you that too? Yeah because he was blaming 911 because they didn't show up in time to help her. How did he know that she made that call? I don't know. OK. Um, Although investigators have since released information about that phone call, at the time Ken told Sally that was still privileged information. So the fact that Ken knew about that call is really odd. Back in 1981, Ken was trying to say that he learned about that phone call from a friend who worked at the phone company, but he wouldn't give the name. In 2010, Corporal Tice sat down with Ken and asked him about that specific phone call. How did you find out about the call? Someone that I grew up with called me from the phone company. And you still don't want to tell us who that person no. is? And my, my question would be why? Why? Because yeah. I may need them one day for something. I don't know where all this is going to go, you know? I suspect that uh, this could get tuned up again. Well, I think you're right. But if, if you truly want to be out from under that cloud of suspicion... If he is if he is still working for them, see, he could lose his job. I would say to you that our intent... His name, I'll give you his name. Okay. Jimmy Stokes. Hey, Mr. Stokes, are you there? I am. Did you ever work for a phone company? Yes, I did. Retired for 31 years for phone company. 
I'm investigating a case that involves a person, Kenneth Canode. Does that name ring a bell to you? Yes, sir. Went to high school with him. I know him, yes. Okay. His wife was murdered back in March of 1981, and there was a phone call made from the residence, and during the investigation, uh, Mr. Canode uh, claimed that he got information from a friend who worked at Southern Bell. He mentioned your name and that you were possibly that person he got the information from. I can tell you, I did not have access to that information. If I did, I certainly would not share it with anybody because that's proprietary information. I certainly wouldn't risk my job for anybody. So by him making that statement, that statement is totally false as it relates to you, correct? That is absolutely correct. I don't know about you, but this sucker don't deserve to live like this. This guy has scammed his life. It's just incredible. All the people that he's hurt, and here he lives high and... High and mighty. Yeah. Steve Spingola and Corporal Tice have traveled to the affluent town of Plano, Texas, to try and talk to Ken. Get your game for yourself. Here he comes. Yeah, so. Ken, how are you? I'm all right. Sean Tice, you remember me? Not really. Detective with the Sheriff's Office in St. John's County, Florida? Yeah. How are you? Steve Spangol, how you doing, Ken? Out comes this guy. Um, he's as tall as I am, 6'4", but he wouldn't come off that porch. He just wanted to keep looking down at me. Came back to talk to you one more time, if you'd have me. Nope. Not at all? Shepard said not to talk to you. This is not a stupid individual. He talked about his lawyer. You could just feel his ego standing up there like, like a president on his throne. I wanted to reach up and rip him down. Shepard told me not to talk to you guys anymore. Here's a guy who tells us he had nothing to do with her death, but he won't help us solve it. All right, Ken. I'm sorry you came all this way. I don't mind. We'll see you soon. This case is 33 years old and Ken's never called the sheriff's office one time to talk to us about what the status of the case was. Is anyone responsible for his wife's murder gonna be brought to justice? Damn it. God, he pisses me off. It just shows that he just doesn't care. You've been fighting this fight for a long time. Well, me personally, five years. Others before me, for sure. So you've been down this road before, Sean, and now it's time, because you've done it all one more time for the last time forever. You're not going to be able to revisit this case again. This Correct. is it. This is it. So? It's my overwhelming desire that we can convince our state attorney to move forward with a prosecution in this case. we got to go. The family deserves it. The victim certainly deserves it. And Mr. Knode certainly doesn't deserve the lifestyle that he's currently living. God. That was beautiful. We got to go. All right, I'm going to see. It's me. I'm going to see him. Let us know. Steve. Take hey, care, boy. We'll be back. Hey. Corporal Tice and Sergeant Dean had decided that it is time to present this case to their state's attorney. According to his exes, Ken has a history of using women for financial gain. I lost my house. I lost my company. And was desperate to get out of his marriage. I shouldn't have left you. My marriage was a mistake. I'm getting out of this. So when you add in there that he allegedly offered Tweet Burrell's money to kill Nancy. Did he say what that $10,000 was for? To take somebody out. And that Jimmy Stokes denied ever telling Ken about that emergency call. That's my carry information. I certainly wouldn't risk my job for anybody. There is a lot to present to the state's attorney. Hey. hey. Gentlemen. Hey. All right. Think it went well? Good. They're going to yeah. review what we created this week and hopefully get it assigned to an attorney there for a complete review, which meaning they will take the time to read every report, listen to every recording. The same scrutiny that we gave it this week, get one of their prosecutors to give it that scrutiny. That's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Good news, a, well, a good week's news. worth of great work led to that, so that's awesome. Working with Cold Justice and the team was uh, an outstanding experience. Great. It was a blessing, something I'll cherish and never forget. Even though we don't have a solid yes from the state's attorney's office yet, there is still great momentum for this case. We're just hoping that the family's gonna understand that. We met with uh, the state, and um, 
they're going to give a, a good look, I think, and then we'll see where we come out after that look. So we're way ahead of where we were, so that's a positive thing. We would all tell you that after all the work that happened with this group effort, the case is better. It's firmer, it's stronger, and you wouldn't be sitting here without this man. I hope you wouldn't. And I have to say that his department and he and his partner are fantastic. I would never have expected this in a million years. I don't even know what I could do to tell them how much this means to me. I appreciate everything you have yeah, done. You guys coming in, so doing all this. You've worked so hard on me. When we started working on this case, the ongoing investigation had stopped. Nobody was talking about it. Now everyone is talking about it. It's moving forward. They are all working together as a team to bring Nancy's killer to justice.